In this discussion, we will rederive this well-known formula, famous formula for least square solutions of linear systems of equations. In the case where you have way too many equations for the number of unknowns that you have, or in other words, the column space of the matrix is not rich enough to give us the right hand side exactly, so you have to find the best possible solution. The geometric analogy of it is what I'm about to describe. But I want to say the kind of discussion that this will be. This will be a classical discussion where objects are treated on their own terms. We will have an entirely geometric discussion where we talk about lengths, angles, and all the other sorts of things that come up with geometry. And we will state the answer in geometric terms. And then once the answer is obtained in geometric terms, and there's only one geometric observation that you need to make, we'll translate it into algebra using the inner product. Because remember, one of the tenets of the inner product is that it's capable of expressing any geometric idea algebraically. So that's what we're going to see here. We will express the idea, geometric, excuse me, we will come up with the idea geometrically, and then as soon as we translate it into algebra with the help of inner products, in this case it has to be the dot product because that's the only uh, reasonable inner product for geometric spaces, we will have our answer and it'll be this. So because geometry only works in no more than three dimensions, this does not in any way constitute a proof for this, but it is certainly geometric intuition, which is sometimes much more important than a proof. We've already proved this, and we used it in the arithmetic sense, essentially, by using calculus. So we have a proof of this, it used calculus because we treated, treated this as an arithmetic problem that can be solved by calculus. So we don't need to prove it again. We just need to come up with geometric intuition. That's the goal of this discussion. And by the way, we've already come up with semi-geometric intuition. And I even accidentally threw out the word projection when I was saying that. Because we talked about decomposition by inner product, which is a pretty geometric idea if you pepper that discussion with the word projection. So we already have a semi-geometric interpretation of this, but right now we'll come up with a pure geometric interpretation of this. Okay, here is the setup. We have a plane spanned by A1 and A2, not in any way orthogonal. Just two vectors spanning a plane. And we have a third vector, B, that's not in that plane. And what we're trying to do, because we can't represent it as a linear combination of A1 and A2, to find the closest thing to B, which can be represented as a linear combination of A1 and A2. Let me write down what we're looking for. We're looking for this linear combination. We're looking for this linear combination. In other words, we're looking for a vector in this plane that's as close to B as possible. So all we need to do is answer the question of which vector in the plane is as close to B as possible. Describe it geometrically. What is that vector? It's right, am I aiming wrong? It's right here-ish where this vector is, where this angle is the right angle. So you drop a perpendicular onto the plane. It's entirely obvious geometrically. If this is my plane and this is my vector, which vector in the plane is the best approximation of this one? Well, it's the one right there, right underneath the tip. Just go straight down. So. Do you guys agree with the geometric? You know, that's least, that's least squares right there. Now, let's just write down this property of being orthogonal to the plane algebraically. Well, number one, what's orthogonal to the plane? It's this segment right here. 
So now let's, tr let's try to figure out what the segment is. The segment is this vector, which is the one closest to B. We can't get B, we can get this one. So that's the vector that's closest to B. What would be a good letter for it? We don't need a letter for it. It's right here. It's alpha, a, alpha 1, A1 plus alpha 2, A2. And what this guy is, it's the difference between that and B. And because I don't want to change this plus sign, I will actually subtract B from this sum. That's this vector right here. In fact, it's this one, right? Yeah, it's this one. Okay. And it's orthogonal to the plane. That's what determines this point. That's what determines alpha 1 and alpha 2. But that's the geometric perspective on it. Now we have to take that decisive step from geometry to algebra. We need to replace the geometric word that's in here, which is orthogonal, right? That's the only geometric word. The other word that we're using is linear combination, which is an algebraic term already. Or plane, well, that's just span, right? So everything has an algebraic translation. So the one thing that's not translated is orthogonal. How does the concept of orthogonality get translated into algebra? Inner product equals zero, am I right? So we have to say that the inner product of this vector with perhaps anything in the plane, with any other vector in the plane, is zero. But to be orthogonal to any other vector in the plane, you only need to be orthogonal to a1 and a2. Do you agree with me? Here is two vectors, a1 and a2. And if you think of a vector that's orthogonal to both a1, which would have to be this, and a2, well, that's the only one. And if it's orthogonal, well, or minus. And if it's orthogonal to a1 and a2, it's orthogonal to anything else in the plane. So in order to be orthogonal to anything in the plane, or as we would say, it, orthogonal to the plane, it just needs to be orthogonal to A1 and orthogonal to A2. So I just have to take this, dot it with A1, and make it equal 0. And then I have to take this vector again, dot it with A2, make that equal 0. And then that should present two equations for alpha 1 and alpha 2. Do you guys agree with me? because nothing else could, right? We took all of our intuition and came up with a geometric observation that nails the vector. We then translated that observation into algebra. So if it worked in the geometric space, whatever we got in the algebraic space should work as well. So it should work. So let's see. Are you guys beginning to see that that's equivalent to that? that it's just going to be that very same thing, except not with transposes, but with dot products. Dot products become transposes when you take the extra step of translating the dot product or the inner product into matrix notation. That's when you get a transposes. But until that, it's just the dot product. So here's the system that we get. I might as well just start writing it out in matrix form, like this. Okay, and our matrix is A1 dotted with A1, A2 dotted with A1, you see it, A1 dotted with A2, and A2 dotted with A2. I'll use the symmetric property of the inner product to write it like this. And so here's our matrix M. In other words, A transpose A. If I were doing the same sort of idea in Rn, again, expressing this in terms of matrix matrices, this will become A transpose A, and this is A transpose B. We've already talked about the equivalence between these combinations of dot products and those matrix products. So you can review those videos if you need a refresher on that. And so, in that matrix analogy, this is A transpose A. This is our vector of unknowns, I can call it X. And this is 
A transpose B. So I can sense that some of you are rightfully uncertain about from going from here to here. And I agree with you that it's more of a metaphor. It's more of an analogy. This is not equivalent to this. Maybe it would become if we, this, if we chose a basis and went into component space and these were not the vectors themselves but their components and so forth. But then that would also still only work for up to three dimensions. This works in any number of dimensions. So this is analogous. It's math, linear algebra, any other subject of math. The way you feel comfortable about it is by having these analogies play off of each other. So this is analogous to this. So right now this argument does not prove this formula. We proved it before more robustly. But it certainly gives outstanding geometric intuition for it. And I think for that purpose it's very, very useful. 